about the coming of the King, that Jesus is the coming King. We all know that. We all know Christmas is on its way, um, and there's all sorts of different kinds of people in the world when it comes to Christmas. Um, there's people like me who are counting down how many more weeks it is till Christmas and get excited already. Do you know, in Australia, we actually get, we start putting up our Christmas tree in a couple of weeks' time because we have this thing called the Christmas pageant, which is a whole bunch of floats with Christmas themes that drive through the streets in summer weather and, uh, and celebrate the coming of a snowy Christmas. Um, and that happens on the first Saturday of November and we're allowed to put our Christmas tree up on the first Saturday of November. So I kind of got excited by that, but I'm a bit stuck here because I don't have that pageant. So I might have to wait until first Advent and wait until December before my tree goes up. So I'll just wait a little bit longer. We've got a rule in our house, you're not allowed to sing Christmas songs until it's Christmas time. So Chloe and I are sort of itching to start singing Christmas songs and every now and then Chloe will start humming and Jacob will go, no, you're not allowed to. Because <laughs> otherwise they're not special if you don't sing them just at Christmas time, if you sing them all the time. So we're, we're holding our breath and looking forward to it. So there's people like me and there's people who are sort of going, oh, not again. Christmas, oh, the drama, buying gifts, preparing meals, whose family are we going to? Should have mentioned this also in the, in the notices. You'll notice on our notice board, we've already planned our Christmas services. So keep an eye out for that as it's coming up. But of course, we have to think in advance about what we're going to do for Christmas. So they're already, the dates are up there on the notice board. So we're, pre we're in the middle of a series about the coming of the king. And Jesus is the coming king. He doesn't remain a little baby. He grew into a man. And so we're hearing about what kind of king Jesus was and what kind of kingdom he brought. And in this story here, We've got a comparison between Jesus' kingdom and Caesar's kingdom because Caesar's kingdom was a kingdom that taxed people. Now, you've got to be very careful when you talk about tax in Switzerland. And there's a quite a few little nervous giggles and laughs around the room, so you all know what I'm talking about, um, that people think that you know, Switzerland is a place where everybody just hides from the tax man and wants to avoid paying, paying tax. But how do you preach a sermon about paying tax to Caesar without mentioning tax? You can't do it. But we've got also got to remember that this is a different kind of thing that we're talking about. There's two different kinds of taxes in Caesar's day and here. Here, the government that we have in Switzerland didn't come in one day, take over Switzerland and say, you will now start paying us taxes. Uh, they were elected by the people and told to do a certain job and they say, well, we need money to do those jobs to build hospitals and schools and things like that, so we're going to have to tax you to do that kind of thing. So there are two very different ways of looking at what kind of taxes we're talking about in the Bible and the kind of taxes that we talk about in everyday life. Now, for Jesus, his kingdom's not about fear, whereas Caesar's kingdom was all about fear. Caesar came in and said, I am here to bring peace. Caesar called himself the son of God because apparently his father ascended to heaven and so therefore he must, being the son of his previous, the previous Caesar, he must be the son of God then because his father ascended to heaven. So Caesar would on his notes actually have written the son of God. So when you start to put that into context about what they started to say about Jesus, they were saying that no, no, Caesar's not the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. That's why they started to come up with these kind of terminology. And that Caesar was also called the high priest. The high priest, the son of God, Caesar. Now he was a conquering emperor who came into an area, took it over by force, used crucifixion, which, you know, that looks like a really pretty cross, but crucifixion was a really ugly form of capital punishment to tell people that if you rebel against Rome, this is what we do to you. We're going to nail you to a cross for everyone to see and we're going to make it as brutal and bloody and horrible as possible so that everybody's going to say, I don't want to be up there, so there's no way I'm going to fight against Rome. So there's Caesar's kingdom, which is a, a kingdom of fear. Do what you're told or you'll end up up there. Pay me my taxes or you'll end up up there. <coughs> Pay me my taxes, Look out, do what I tell you to or my soldiers will come get you. And they were march marching through the town. Don't think the people of Jerusalem were too happy about that plan, were they? They really didn't like it a great deal. And in fact, history tells us when there was an uprising against that, that's when Caesar said enough and tried to wipe Jerusalem off the face of the earth and obliterated the temple and did all of that. That was in 66 AD. So Caesar was a king of fear. Did Jesus come to bring a kingdom of fear? Is his kingdom the same? Because, you know, growing up, and I grew up in a church... I actually thought he was. 
because I was told to be very afraid of God because he was angry with me for all the sins that I've caused in my life and he was going to punish me unless I turned to him. I was sold this kingdom of fear that God is a, a, a terrible, nasty, mean person who's going to beat you on the head with a stick until you repent. And we were sold what we called in, in the youth group for fun, fire insurance. You know, you don't want to go to hell, so uh, you better sign up and, you know, sign up to God's team and then you won't go to hell. So you got fire insurance from the fires of hell by becoming uh, a believer. I don't know how good at believing we actually were as youth, but we certainly didn't want to go to the other place. So we were really sold a kingdom of fear. The thing is, after a while, people don't reconcile that with a loving God. And quite a lot of my friends then turned away from the church afterwards and said, you know what, that's not the kind of thing I want to have anything to do with. That's not the kind of God I want to have anything to do with. So if that's God, if you're all telling me that's what God is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they turned away from the church. All these kids who with me at youth groups were, you know, if you used the terminology, if you've ever been around youth groups, being on fire for God. Have you heard that before? We were all so spiritually ready to tell everybody about our faith and share everything we possibly could. And 90% and of those people now no longer have anything to do with Jesus or the church. And that's sad. That is really sad. Because I don't believe they were sold the kind of God that we actually have. I don't believe they were sold the kind of God that we should be seeing. And the kind of God that Jesus shows us that he is. What his kingdom is like. Now, I like politics. I know that makes me weird and strange. Um, but I like politics more than sport. I like watching Australian football. But uh, I like watching politics even more. Um, and Australian politics is about as brutal as Australian football. So uh, I don't know if you know much about Australian politics, but we change our Prime Minister like we change our shoes. Um, I don't know how many we've had in the last 10 years, but every time, see, because we don't vote for a head of state. We don't vote for a president, someone, one person. We vote for a party, and whoever leads that party is the Prime Minister. So they can decide who they want to lead their party at any time. So any time somebody in their party, we have the two main ones, are Labor and Liberal in Australia, so, for example, if it's the Liberal Party, if they uh, want to, you know, de-head the, the person at the top, they'll just start putting out opinion poll after opinion poll saying they're not a very, doing a very good job. Hey, I can do a better job, make me the leader, and all of a sudden they're the new Prime Minister. This guy gets kicked out, told to resign, told to leave, or, you know, we're going to lose the next election, so you've got to step aside and let this person come in. And then a new um, Prime Minister is installed in Parliament. And of course, Australians, um, well, people like me particularly, I'll get out the popcorn and the red wine and I'll sit and watch the 24-hour news and watch what's happening because you see all the people, oh, this person's just come from out of this office and gone to that office and there's all these things going on in the background and reporters like to make a story out of nothing. And so it's quite interesting to watch. It's a bit hard to do that here in Switzerland because I don't understand the political system as well. So it's a bit more difficult. So, I've kind of got to live my political fun through the German politics, which you might not all be so, uh, so um, up to date with, but I like to keep an eye on what the German politics are doing. And I'm starting to get into it. I'm starting to get interested in, in who's, which party believes what and thinks what things and that kind of stuff, because it's a whole other system. It's a whole other ballgame to Australian politics. But for me, it's a bit of a sport. You've got these advers adversaries on both sides, and this side strongly believes this point and this side strongly believes that point and you can get people who will either blindly follow this party or, or blindly follow that party and never ever ever question what their party's policies are because that's my party's policy so I'm on their team so I'm going to follow that team to the nth degree. I'm going to go as far as I can to follow that team. A similar thing is going on here in this question that the Pharisees are asking Jesus. There's this us versus them mentality. They hated the Romans, absolutely hated the Romans. So all the people that Jesus is talking to saying, I have this new kingdom and I'm going to be installed as the king of this new kingdom. All these people that are hearing this are saying, well, if that's going to happen, then that means you're going to overthrow Rome. Yay, we want that. So they were all on Jesus' side. Remember, they waved palm branches and said, praise the coming king. But I don't think they were expecting the kind of king that Jesus was at that point. They were expecting someone who's going to kick Caesar out and take over and rescue Jerusalem from slavery. That's what they were looking for. 
But that's not the kind of king that Jesus came to be. So that's what's going on here. They're asking him, so the Romans want us to pay this tax. Should we pay tax to the Romans? Now, this is a political question. Because if Jesus says, yes, you should pay tax to the Romans, he's like the Herodians. He's siding with the Romans and saying we should just get along with them. So none of the people are going to follow Jesus anymore. The Pharisees knew this. So he couldn't do that. So he can't side with Rome. But if he goes against Rome, well, Rome's going to come in and you know, do what they eventually did to him anyway. And they're going to come and knock him off. So one way or another, Jesus loses. You know, you know you've heard those questions before where there is no right and wrong answer. Have you heard those kind of things before? You know, the most uh, uh, shocking one is if somebody goes up to somebody and says, have you stopped beating your wife? If you say no, are you still beating your wife? If you say yes, you used to beat your wife? <laughs> so no matter what you do, you're in a rock and a hard place. And I'm certainly not advocating that by any stretch of the imagination. This is the kind of question that Jesus was caught up in here. No matter what he said, he wasn't going to be right. No matter what he said, he was in trouble. This was a question to trick him. It wasn't an honest question. When Peter and I were up here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about having honest questions. You know, there's those questions that you have when you're really just trying to prove your point of view. And there's honest questions where you really want to know an answer. These weren't honest questions that Jesus was asked. So he's asked a loaded question. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus being Jesus, he's not going to play their game. He turned it back onto them. Notice what he does. He says, show me the coin. He didn't pull a coin out of his own pocket. Jesus, you know, wasn't a pauper. He would have had one in his pocket or somebody looking after it, I'm sure. He said, show me the coin to the person who's got the question. They handed him a coin, therefore proving that they had Caesar's currency. Because there was two currencies there. There was the temple currency and there was the Roman currency. So they had Caesar's currency to pay Caesar's tax, so therefore they were already paying Caesar's tax. So just simply by owning the coin, they're proving what they think about the tax. They have to pay it, otherwise the Romans are going to lop their heads off, figuratively. Because the Romans like to do that much more. So they pull the coin out of the pocket and give it to Jesus, so he's already won. And he already looks at it, he says, and whose picture is on this coin? Caesar's. And it would have had an inscription along the lines of son of God, king of, you know, the, the, the priest of priests, son of God, on Caesar's coin. He says, well, if that's Caesar's coin, give it back to him. That's a good way out of that question, isn't it? So the question is, when you say Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's, what does that mean to us? We know what it means to them because we've just explained the history of it a bit to you. But what does that mean to us in the 21st century in Switzerland? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. That's the question we should be asking out of this passage. Now, Caesar was the national personification of Rome. You understand that? His image was on the coin. Has anybody got an in, in, uh, instance of that still happening today? Uh, a personification of a country? There's a really obvious one. <laughs> Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, the personification of the United States, is Uncle Sam. In England, it's well, Britannia is the personification of the, uh, on, the, on the coins and stuff, isn't she? The shield and the, that kind of stuff, female personification. And what is it in Switzerland? Helvetia. Helvetia is the personification of Switzerland. Not an actual person, but that is the ideal of Switzerland is built up into this person. The ideal of the states is built up in Uncle Sam. The, I, I don't think we've got one in Australia. I tried to wreck my brains about this. The closest I come to as our national broadcaster, the ABC, is sometimes called Auntie. Um, that's the closest I can come to where they personify something, you know, Auntie. But I don't think we've got one in Australia. I don't know, what would it be? Ned Kelly maybe, but he was a real person. Um, but there's certain countries certainly do have a personification, and this was Caesar's. Caesar was the personification of who Rome was. We are a nation that brings peace. And they did, by going to war with every country in the world and overtaking it and overthrowing it. That's how they brought peace. They'd made sure of that. But this was not one that people loved. Helvetia is not a person, but an idea. 
Uncle Sam is not a real person, but an idea. It's an idea that people know what they want, isn't it? That's what democracy comes down to. The people know what they want, and they will vote for it, and then we give it to them. That's politics in a nutshell, isn't it? I mean, that comes down to democratic politics. You vote for somebody to give you what you want. If you don't give you what you want, you vote them out and get somebody else in next time. That's what voting is about, those countries that have democracy and have it available to them. But the problem is, the Bible tells us the people get it wrong so often. You know, the people said, give us a king. And God said, but kings are going to tax you and send your sons to war. We want a king anyway. Okay, we'll give you a king. The people said to Aaron, we want a golden calf. Aaron said, okay, I'll do what I'm told. I'll get you a golden calf. People quite often ask for stuff and not 100% sure that what they get is the right thing or what they really need. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case in politics, but sometimes we've got to be very careful that just because the people want it doesn't mean it's the right thing. I think Henry Ford is famous for saying that if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have wanted a better um, horse-drawn carriage. But he came up with an automobile and said, look at what I've got for you. And they loved it. And look at it now. They're on every street all over the place. I only wish that the technology had gone as fast as computer technology has gone, but because then every time it broke down, you just have to turn it off and turn it back on again, and it would work again, wouldn't it? That's the way it works. <laughs> but sometimes the people get it wrong, don't they? We do. We have to admit that. You know, there's, there's the big one, that, you know, the elephant in the room that nobody ever wants to talk about. Hitler was voted into power by the people. Shh, don't tell the Austrians, they still don't believe it yet. But that's true. Sometimes the people get it wrong and God says, you know what, my kingdom, I know what you need. They wanted someone to come in and kick out Caesar and free Jerusalem. Jesus said, I'm gonna go a whole lot further than that. <laughs> I'm gonna go way further than just saving one little place in one little part of the world. I'm going to save all mankind for all time and bring them back to me. Now, the people wanted something completely different. But God said, hey, what am I going to give to you? Sometimes the people get it wrong. Sometimes they get it right. So what happens when the government and God don't agree? Now, in really extreme cases, you know, we might stand up against it and do something about it. But who do we side with? Particularly when some of us think that the government is doing the right thing to what God wants and some of us think the government's not doing the right thing to what God wants, then where do you draw the line? When a government says feeding the homeless is illegal, what should we do? When a government says education is only for those with enough money to pay for it, what should we do? When the government says we'll spend more, weapon, uh, more money on weapons than on health, what should we do? When the government says it's okay to condone racism, what do we do? Most of the time, we side with our respective national identities rather than God, because it's easier, it's safer, it's less uncomfortable. We don't want to be uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Do we choose what is safe and comfortable over what is right? We just went to France and got to say, we had a conversation. Should we be doing this? Some nasty things have happened in France in the last couple of years. Um, it could be a dangerous thing to do. Um, one of the perhaps more dangerous places in Europe that we could visit. Do we want to put our kids in that danger? But the more I looked into it and researched it and looked into other things that happened, you'll see in the eConnect, I noticed that there's 13 deaths worldwide a year from vending machines falling on people. You know, there's people who, um, who are put off by swimming because they in Australia because they think sharks are going to attack them. You know, and less than two people get attacked by sharks every year in Australia, yet millions and millions and millions of people swim in the ocean and never have a problem. More people die on Swiss roads every year than have ever been killed by terrorists in Switzerland. <laughs> Um, and the Swiss road death toll is, is actually pretty low. I was surprised at how low it is. It's like 216 people or something. 50 of those are pedestrians. And most of those 50 are probably people looking at their phones and not watching where they're meant to be walking. 
But that's the reality of the world. The world is not a safe place. So us driving to Paris was probably more dangerous than actually going and staying in Paris in the first place because the roads are the most unsafe part of it. Yet we didn't feel unsafe at all on the French roads. It was expensive, but not <laughs> 40 euros each way. Goodness me. Anyway, that's just to drive on their roads. That's not the fuel or anything. That's just the tax that you pay to drive at the A6. But anyway, it's more dangerous to drive in the car than go to Paris. And we said, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime experience for the kids. They need to see the Eiffel Tower in front of them. They need to walk in the Notre Dame Cathedral. They need to go to the Louvre and see the Mona Lisa. But as an aside, I tell you, the picture opposite the Mona Lisa is way better than Mona Lisa. <laughs> Has anybody been to the Louvre? Put your hand up if you've been to the Louvre. So have you seen the picture opposite? You know what I'm talking about? It's the wedding at Cana, and it's the size, or probably twice the size of that wall. It's huge. I mean, the Mona Lisa, in real life, is this big. It's huge, and it's the wedding at Cana where Jesus turned water into wine. This massive, huge, massive thing. And I turned and looked at the Mona Lisa with hundreds of people in front of it. And there's maybe five people looking at the painting I'm looking at thinking, that is a way better painting. There is so much more to see than what you would first imagine. Anyway, that's an aside. But they needed to see that stuff for themselves in real life. And the fear of dangerous things happening really should have been overcome. Did we choose the uncomfortable, the less safe for the experience of a lifetime for our kids? Yeah, we did. Absolutely. And the first day, it took us two hours to drive two kilometres. I thought driving on the wrong side of the road for 30 years, I'm going to be really nervous driving in Paris. But I tell you, when you're stuck in traffic for two hours and you're just going, eh, 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 for two hours, and your GPS is saying, turn left at this street, you get to the street, and there's a policeman with an automatic weapon slung across his shoulder stopping you from going down that street because something's going on down there and you can't go down that street, and you're going, I don't know where I'm going, so you just hope the GPS finds you another route to get to where you're going. Two hours to do the last two kilometres. I think I've earned my stripes by driving in Paris. <laughs> Mind you, I would never drive around the Arc de Triomphe, that's just nuts. <laughs> I sat there watching it for about 10 minutes. There just doesn't seem to be any rules about it. The cars just pull out and just <laughs> boom, boom, that's just crazy. Anyway, I'm glad we walked around Paris. So we chose the less safe, the uncomfortable option. Uh, I was talking to one of the restaurant guys where we, where we ate in Paris, and I ate snails for the first time. It was fantastic. I actually liked it. Um, uh, but I was talking to the restaurant guy, and uh, he was saying, Paris used to be much better, but it just now feels so unsafe. He said, you know, the Bataclan nightclub is 500 metres down the road. That's where those well, 80 people got shot. I didn't know that when we first looked into it, that it was just that close to where we were staying in Paris, but you've got to say, do we choose the safe option? We can live in our little cotton-walled worlds and never go out and never speak to anybody, never share our faith with anyone, but that's not the kingdom that Jesus got us into. Jesus doesn't promise us a safe, happy, fear-free life for the rest of our lives. Any pastor who sells you that has got rocks in their head because you just need to look at the Bible passages to find out that's not true. Every one of the disciples, as far as we know, was martyred for their faith. They died declaring Jesus was king. That doesn't lead to a happy, safe life. You read Paul, the amount of times he was beaten for his faith. That doesn't mean you're going to have a happy, safe, comfortable life for all your life. Now, we're probably not going to face that kind of persecution here in Switzerland. But that doesn't mean that life is going to be easier when we choose to do things our way. When we stand up to the government of the day and say, I don't know if I like that policy you've just brought in. I don't know if I'm really happy about this, that or the other. And stand up and have our say. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you which side to go on because I'd never do that. But we need to make choices about those things and say, what am I going to do with the information that I have? And how am I going to make that choice to the best of my knowledge? And sometimes it might be difficult, and sometimes it might be choosing against the team you normally choose for because you're not happy with what they're doing. Sometimes you might have to choose another team just so that they listen to your voice and hear what you have to say. Sometimes you might need to actually go out into the street with a sign and say, this isn't right, we're not happy with what you're doing. It seems to be the domain of the crazy left-wing nutters that we want to say, they're the protesters of the world, and I'm not one of them, so therefore I won't do that. But what if you're 
protesting a country that's arresting people and locking them up illegally. You know, it might be a dangerous thing to do, but sometime in your life you might want to stand up and do that in solidarity for those people. Do we choose what is safe and comfortable over what is right? And unfortunately, I'd have to say, sadly, we often do choose what is comfortable over what is right. The kingdom of God's love is not about fear. The kingdom of God's about love. God's kingdom is about love. It's not about fear. We shouldn't be afraid of the uncomfortableness that we might face. We should never be afraid of that. We should be aware of it and be careful, but not be afraid of it. We should look for how God wants us to play our part in this kingdom. Because Jesus, and I'll say this till I'm blue in the face, taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as your will has already been done in heaven, we pray that your will is done here on earth. And that's what we want to see. We don't bring it about, we don't make it happen, but we choose to live as if God's in control and Caesar's not, or Helvetia's not, or Uncle Sam's not, or Britannia's not. We pray that the kingdom of God will be here on earth as it is in heaven. That his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's given us a role to play in that. We are his hands and his feet and his mouth here on earth. That's what's called the incarnation. Jesus came to be the incarnation and he incarnated us. We are God's people in his place. That's what it means to be in the image of God. Do you know that? Because that again was taking something that Caesar was saying and doing and turning it into a Christian perspective. We are created in the image of God. When Caesar conquered a region, what would he do? Put up a big statue of himself to say, that's who's in charge. That's what he looks like. He's our boss. Our role is to be that in the world that we're in, to say, God's in charge. Just look at us, see how we live our lives. That's who's in charge. Unfortunately, sometimes when people look at us, they go, don't really like the God that you're following. You don't, the image that you're portraying of the God that you're following isn't really an image I want to follow. And that's where we need to check ourselves and say, are we actually doing what God called us to do or not? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, to pray with one another, to share with one another, to love one another, to encourage one another. Help us to be your people in this place whether we're in Switzerland now for work or for pleasure, whether we're just visiting, whether we're members of the community, help us to be your people here. Show us where you want us to be. Guide us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to act in the way that you want us to act. Help us to bring your kingdom here on earth. We pray these things in your name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I think Serge is